How many of you even know that it was Valentine's Day last week? Oh, Brad, I'm glad you raised your hand, Brad. I was getting a little nervous over there. Good. All right. You know, I was watching online, and I saw this video. And even though Valentine's Day was last Thursday, I was really touched by what I saw. So I'm going to play this little video. It's just a three-minute video for you. And then we'll turn it over to Heather and Susan for some inspirational music, okay? So let's see. Brad, can you get that light switch for me right there? Do you mind? You, you look pretty comfortable. I hate to do that to you. So this is in honor of Valentine's Day. Philip, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> and like all good stories, it starts like this. Once upon a time, there was a father. And in case you can't figure that out, that's me. <laughs> this father had a wonderful little boy. He was very happy. Then one day he found out that his wife was going to have a little baby. So I prayed, Lord, if it's your will, you make a little girl. And he did. I was the first person to hold her in my arms. And I looked at her and I said, Lord, make her like a mother. And he did. She was loving, giving, and so good and so kind. But then I realized I was getting left out. <laughs> so I said, Lord, make her like me. And he did. She could drive a truck and a tractor. She could load the hay and strip the back of it. You realize what you did? <laughs> But at the same time, she was opinionated, emotional, and hard-headed. So I said, Lord, that's enough of that. Make her like you. And he did. He gave her the desire to serve people. She loves people. She gave her life to be a nurse. She's brought people back from the dead. She's held the hand of people and breathed their last breath. He gave her a heart for missions, and she's trekked all over the world, pushed canoes up swollen rivers, and laid on the floor while bullets whizzed outside so she could tell people about Jesus. But still, something was missing. So I said, Lord, make her happy. See that look on her face? I never saw that until she met you. And I'm grateful for that. Today I'm giving you the best thing I have to give. And I just wanted you to know before I do that how hard me and God's work to get her ready for. <laughs> Tough act to follow a little bit, just after Valentine's Day. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my husband was just telling me of all the churches that have canceled this morning, which I'm a little bewildered about that. But anyway, Good News Fellowship has not canceled, and we invite you to stand with us, praise the Lord, worship the Lord. And um, the first song we're going to do is Majestic. And when we look outside and see the beauty, the absolute beauty of the white snow, which reminds us that he cleanses us with his own blood and makes us as white as snow. Oh 
that we're doing today, um, talking about the name of Jesus. And we know in God's word, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, and I think sometimes we think of that as being a future event, and it is a future event, but we need to be bowing to him every day of our lives. We need to humble ourselves before him. And we need to realize that his name is above all names. There is no other name like Jesus. As morning dawns and, and evening fades, you
to you this morning, God, and we are so grateful, Lord, for the name of Jesus. Lord, because we know there is no power in any other name except the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for touching hearts today, God. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our praise and worship to you, God. We know, Lord, that you covet those uh, times that we can come to you and praise and worship you. So thank you, Lord, for being here with us today, God, in the midst of us. Pray now, God, that you would be with Brother Jim as he comes to preach to us this morning, God. Help us to have open and receptive hearts for what you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Heather and Susan. Give them a good hand this morning. I appreciate that. And how about the orchestra and the video work they put together? Gerald did all that, put that video together? No, we, we just bought, we buy those. But they look, they are nice, though. They are nice, and Gerald could do that if he had the time to do it. I know that. He's certainly capable to do that. At this time, we're going to have a corporate time of prayer. And for those of you that are regular attenders, you know we believe in prayer. We believe in Bible study, believe in fellowship, believe in breaking bread together. We try to do those four things that the early church did when it started off 2,000 years ago. That's the foundation we're laying here at the Good News Fellowship to see this work go forward, to see people come to know Christ on a regular basis, see people baptized. That's what we're working on doing. So nothing more important than taking time for prayer. So at this time, Jen always writes them down for me. She's got the pen right there. Uh, so prayer requests, praises, anything you'd like to bring up today. Kerry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think Jody needs one more volunteer. Well, our goal is to have four volunteers so that one you only have to do it one week a month, right? So that makes it very simple. So Jody's got the program all organized. It goes along with what we're doing with the daily Bible readings that I'm handing out for adults, for teens to do, that we do in Bible class at the school. So it's the same theme that's all the way through it. So if you're a two-year-old, you have the same th uh, theme as if you're a Hundred-year-olds, same thing, same common theme through the scriptures. So we go through the Bible together. So Jody's organized that very, very well. Matter of fact, I, I, I'm going to just as we dial it in a little bit more, I'm going to send it out to Word Life because I think they could use that in a lot of churches they're in. That would really help the other pastors and churches who use Word Life Ministries. So great job. So think about it, pray about it, and uh, you know, if you feel like that's what you want to do, just see Jody. And I think we also need one more week of nursery workers, too. We like to be prepared so that if people come with babies. Obviously, we can. We don't just go up there and sit there and wait. If we have babies here, we'll go up and we'll have nursery for them, too. If you haven't been around and looked at the nurseries upstairs on the second floor up there, it's very, very cute. It's all Noah's Ark decorated. Very nice place for babies to be like that. So Jody's kind of coordinating both of those ministries, both those workers on that. So thank you very much, Carrie, for bringing that up. Definitely a good prayer request on that. Other requests, praises. How about some praises? Nadine. Small groups, cell group, yep. Yep. I can tell you for sure that when the senior pastor arrives, you won't have to worry about that. I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you. So that is in the works. Thank you, Nadine. Yes, Jeanette. Okay, a friend of uh, Jeanette's mom, a friend of Jeanette's mother passed away of lung cancer uh, about a week or two ago. So be sure and pray for a bereavement for that family this time. Sonny, go ahead. Amen. That's right. Give the Lord a hand for that one. I love that one, Sonny. Good job. 
Solid Bible principle. You help others. You can't outgive the Lord. So if you see someone in need, open your wallet, open your refrigerator. What do you have to open? Open your car, whatever it takes to help that person, and you will be repaid from the Lord like that. Someone else. Got you? Yes. Sorry, Nadine, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't recognize that name. Know a lot of cars, but not. I don't. Okay. Okay. Yep. What's his wife's name? Kathy Card. Bob and Kathy Card had them. You know. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nadine. Appreciate that. Does anybody here know Bob or Kathy? Okay. 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 All right. No, I don't happen to know Bob. So let me know if there's an opportunity to go and, you know, make sure he knows Christ as his Savior. Be glad to do it. You know, I don't know him. Don't know where he lives. Yep. But I'll go with you, Nadine. You set it up, and I'll go with you. Cause we, it must be the, the cards are obviously a big family, so there's a lot of them around like that. I want to make sure we always pray for the right senior pastor for the Good News Fellowship. We are blessed today to have one of our uh, candidates that we've talked with, uh, Brother Jim and his wife, Tina, and his son, John, is with us today. He'll be sharing, and as I've told him, I spent quite a bit of time yesterday, you know, getting acquainted. We did a Skype together on the phone, and uh, as I told him, you speak whatever God lays on your heart. You have total liberty when you come here. So if any of you get mad at me for what he says today, I have no idea what he's going to say, and I don't care. Whatever God's telling him, that's what we want to listen to, and that's the message it's going to be. So I'm very excited to have him and his family here today. Very excited. Um, I want, I'm just going to give you a term. You don't really know what it is, but Census 2013. That's a plan I've thought about for a lot of months like that. I'm trying to get in on paper like that so we can visit every home in Hancock County within a 30-day period to leave the gospel there, to share the gospel with them, actually give them an opportunity, invite them to accept Christ as Savior. So we're fine-tuning the details now internally as a staff. We're working on it. Uh, we've got it tentatively set up for about a month from now. If we're not comfortable, we've got all the details set up. We'll make it another month like that. We're not going to do it till God says it's ready to go and we can make an impact on our whole county. But I'm pretty excited about that. So just think of Census 2013. Someone else? Yes, Heather. Who here is in Heather's French class? I'm just curious. Jocelyn is? Okay, Jocelyn. Yeah, it was, Heather said it was romantic. It wasn't for me. She made me the maitre d', so I had to wait on everybody, <laughs> escort the parents in like that, get them to the table like that. And I guess it wasn't too tough, though, was it, Sean? I did all right on that. No, it wasn't too bad, right? All right. Yes. Very good. Yes, Bobby. Who, who is it again? Randy Kelly? Okay. Okay. Okay, that'd be Randy's wife. I don't know the family. Girlfriend, okay, I don't know the family, so, okay. Yes, no, no. Yep. Yep, Noreen Folsom's mother, Nadine, she's had a really quite a sick, about a bit a while ago like that. She wasn't doing real good, and now she's kind of rebounded and doing, all, doing a lot better now. Good, good. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, oh, I see a hand back. Almost couldn't see the hand behind Sonny there. Sorry.
okay? So Peter's going to have to see a surgeon, may possibly, no doubt, have surgery maybe, uh, unless the Lord chooses to heal you in the meantime, which he can certainly do. He created you. I think he can heal you. He can take care of you like that. So we'll pray that way either way. Yes. All right, Susan. Awesome. Praise the Lord for hearing, yeah. You've been healed with a hearing aid, right? <laughs> the healing aid's been healed, repaired, updated. I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, before we go into prayer, I, I'm going to just start it out with another video. And I had this planned for Cin Cindy and Kevin DePringer. How many of you know them? Okay. I, I had a, a, I wanted to do, I did a prayer for Kevin. He was just deployed uh, to Afghanistan. And I thought he was going to be here this weekend, so I was going to surprise him with this right here. So I, I made sure to text his wife yesterday, make sure Kevin's here tomorrow. She said he was, de he was deployed this morning. So just yesterday morning he was deployed. But you know what? I still want to add him on the prayer list, uh, Kevin DePringer. And if there's any, any, obviously we have other people connected with the service that's here. How many here have someone that's in the service or that's uh, serving in the military right now? That's, all right. Know somebody? I know John is. Okay, right there, several of you, Josh. So I, I just think, I think this video, this to me would have been a touching video for Cindy and Kevin like that. And, you know, Cindy's obviously going to be alone for a while. This is his third tour of duty over in Afghanistan. So we need to, as a fellowship, kind of make sure we kind of look out for her. Give her a call, make sure she's doing okay, and see if there's anything we can do to help her out like that in his absence like that. No, no. So he just left yesterday. And uh, so I, want, I just want to show this video. Uh, let's see, who can I, yeah, all right, Steve, we'll get Steve on this here. Brad settled in pretty comfortable in that chair over there like that, so. So this, I wanted to do this to honor Kevin, but also to honor anybody that's connected in the service. I know we have several that are retired from the services like that. We really appreciate people that have, that have served for our country like that. So we don't take it for granted, and I don't think that any day, it doesn't have to be 4th of July to be patriotic about people that serve that nation, okay? Hope you like this. Yeah. 
if you are in the service, have been in the service, or have a relative, close relative in the service, stand up while we pray right now. I want to pray for Kevin. And, I'm, and then you can sit down when I get done praying for Kevin. It's an honor for all you people that have been in the service like that. Let's give him another hand. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to honor people that serve our country, God. I think uh, uh, Kevin and Cindy Dupringer today, God, is God, Kevin was deployed yesterday, God, and I was really hoping that he could be here, and God, possibly if this is videoed, he'd be able to see this, God, but Kevin, we love you. We're praying for you. We will pray for you, and we'll watch over Cindy while you're gone and, and serving our country in Afghanistan, God, so just please watch, watch over that family, God, and I pray for each of these people that have served or are serving right now or have uh, close family members that are serving, God, that you would protect their family members, protect their friends, and God, may they realize how much we love and appreciate the sacrifice they are making for us, that we could have freedom and liberty here at home. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated, and I'm going to pray for this. Thank you very much, too. I appreciate that. And if you see Cindy or Alex Dupringer, their son, be sure and tell them that we love them and we're praying for them. Okay, now we'll pray for the request for the day. Dear God in heaven, you've heard each and every request and praise and petition that's been brought to you, God. And God, we take time to pray to you because you are a prayer hearing, a prayer answering God. You are a powerful God. You control the events of this universe, God. Oh, I know there's a, another guy, Satan, giving us a problem every now and then down here, God. But really, he thinks he's in control, but we know that you have power over him, God. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world, God. So we bring these requests to you today, God. And I think of uh, Kids Nation workers, God. Uh, we need one more volunteer, I think, in nursery and one more for the uh, Kids Nation program. So please have someone speak to Jody. Touch a heart that would help out just one Sunday a month, God. That would be a big help to Jody as well, God. Thank you for Jody putting that together as well, Lord. It's an excellent program where we teach uh, Bible principles to the very youngest of our, of our babies right here at the Good News Fellowship. God, for Nadine, who wants these small groups, these small fellowships for prayer and for Bible study, back just as soon as possible, God. And God, I pray that you'd allow that to get started in a positive way with exactly the right topics and the right type of fellowship as midweek services, God, midweek meetings. For Jeanette's friend who lost their mother to lung cancer, I pray that you'd be with them in this time of bereavement. For Sonny, as he had a praise that uh, as he was... Uh, uh, blessed and led to give a friend some food and some stuff a couple days ago that uh, his daughter returned that, God, unexpectedly to him, God. And, God, we know we can't outgive you, and you're a wonderful, wonderful God. And, God, thank you for uh, that principle of giving that you put in your word to teach us with. For Bob Card, who is dying of lung cancer, and his wife, Kathy, I pray, God, that, God, I don't know Bob. I don't know if he knows your son, Jesus, is Savior, God. But, God, if he doesn't, he needs to, God. So I pray that you would open a door uh, for me or someone in the fellowship to go and, and share the good news that they can be saved, God. Uh, God, Bob's dying of lung cancer now, but we're all dying every second, every breath that we take, God. We're all uh, going to leave this earth someday, God. And the important thing is, where are we going to spend eternity, God? And we do that by a choice of having faith and trust in your son, Jesus. So be of that family, and I pray for Bob's soul at this time, God. God, we pray for the a right senior pastor at exactly the right time for the Good News Fellowship, God. And, God, you've, you've assembled a really, really good team here at the Good News Fellowship, God. I'm proud of each and every one of them. We work well together. We have good relationships together, God. And, God, we're missing that one key, and key ingredient, God, is a senior pastor here at the Good News Fellowship, God. You know the need, Lord. And, God, I pray that you give us exactly the right person at exactly the right time, God. God, I thank you that uh, Brother Jim and his family could be here with us, God. And we're looking forward to hearing them minister, to get acquainted with them at the, at the fellowship afterwards, God. It's just fun serving you and meeting other people, God, other brothers and sisters from different parts of the country. For Census 2013, God, I pray that that would be a, a great awakening kickoff, God, that would spread not only uh, through Hancock County, but nationally and globally as well, God. And I know there's other people that are trying to do the same thing in the United States, God. So, God, I pray that you bless each and every effort to see us return to the roots of, of Christianity, the Bible roots of this country had, God, because we need a great revival, God. We don't need a financial revival, God. We need a spiritual revival here in America, God. So, I pray that you would help that to happen and help us to be a part of it, God. Lord, uh, for Heather's praise for the French class dinner, God. It was fun putting that on. I know the parents had a very good time. Seen to, Lord. It was a good time of fellowship as well. And I pray for uh, her request for guidance and protection for a friend of hers. Uh, for Randy Kelly and Russell Burns, both just passed away for their families right now, God. 
And Lord, I pray that God, uh, again, that those men knew Christ as Savior, God. And I pray for their families at this time, that uh, you would be a comfort to them spiritually, emotionally, in every way in their life, God. For Noreen's mother, Nadine, God, I thank you that she's uh, doing much better, God, because she was having a tough time, uh, God, even a, a few weeks ago, God. So thank you for giving her mother her health back to her, God. And, God, I pray that you would uh, continue to be with Nadine as she helps take care of her mother, God. Uh, God, for Peter's knee, God, uh, that you would, um, God, I pray that you'd heal it, God. Uh, God, we don't have to go to surgeons. We don't have to go to the hospital. We don't have to go to doctors. We can come to you, God. So, God, first of all, I pray that you just heal his knee, God. Now, God, you can do it with just a twinkling of an eye, God, if you choose to do that, God. Or you can heal him by going to a doctor, God. However you choose, I pray that his knee, knee would be healed 100%. God, thank you that Susan's hearing aids are doing well, God. Uh, God, that's, that's very difficult when you can't hear people talk to you, God, and you're trying to read lips, God. And I know Susan has struggled with that for a while, God, with the older hearing aids that she had, God. So I thank you for providing the funds for her to get there, God, and I thank you that she's doing well with them getting them adjusted, and God, I pray that the hearing aids would allow her to heal just as good as she could possibly hear, God, so please be with that. God, I do want to close again praying for Kevin Dupringer, God, and, and for Cindy, and for Alex, for their family, God, and God, as they just left, he was just deployed yesterday, God, I pray that you be with him, give him protection, watch over him, keep him safe, and be with Cindy, God. God, be with her emotionally, God, be with her spiritually, God, help her to put her faith and her trust in you, that you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So watch over them at this time. God, we love you. We pray that you'd answer each prayer. We thank you for each request that's been mentioned today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss, bless you. We're going to, see, he's from Virginia, so he's not used to this. This Well, this is like summer to us, I told his, his mother up here. This is really summer for us maniacs up here, but it's a little cool from what they're used to like that. So, uh, John, it's nice to have you with us today. At this time, we're going to dismiss our Kids Nation. If you would go with Miss Jody and Kids Nation, I guess Carrie is helping today, or Charles, or whoever's helping. Who is? Oh, now Jody's not going. The Charles St. Clair is heading it up today. Give Charles a good hand. I appreciate him stepping up like that. You know what, Charles, just before you read the room right now, you let these two walk out right there. I want to pray for Doreen. She's not here today because she's sick. Is that correct? Okay. Shame on you for not reminding me. Shame on me for not remembering it. Okay. So I want to pray right now for Doreen before, before they're going out with the kids like that. Dear God, I, I pray for Doreen, Lord. I know she's been struggling with some health issues, God. And God, please forgive me for not uh, just having it written down when I saw Charles first thing this morning, God. And she wasn't with him, God. So, God, if she's watching us online today, Doreen, we love you, God. And love you, Doreen. And God, I pray that you watch over her, God. That even right now, while she's watching uh, the live streaming, that you would heal her in a positive way, God. God, matter of fact, I pray that you do it instantly. She'd have to call Charles on his cell phone, God, and, and just, just say, you know what, I'm feeling better, God. You, and God, just give her a great, a miraculous healing of time right now. So please be with her, God. And, and God, bring her back as soon as possible to the Good News Fellowship. We miss her. She's a, a very nice lady, God, and we do miss her not being here. So God, just be with her health at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, so... Uh, Justin and Johanna Fickett, they are on their way to New Hampshire. They're getting a new baby in their family. Anybody know what the baby is? What kind of dog is it? St. Bernard. Oh, my word. All right. So anyway, they left early with the storm, so that's why they're not here this morning. He sent me a text last night and said that there was at the dance that they put on at Youth Nation last night, a stormy night, obviously, not a huge crowd, had about 20, 25 kids out, but one decision for Christ last night. So I'll be honest with you, if they only had one at the dance last night and that one got saved, it'd be worth it to me right there. That's how simple I am when it comes to that stuff right there. But uh, they were excited about that. I know they had a good time. I happened to peek in before I, I left for Bangor, and, uh, you know, there's all decorated nice, really, really looked nice. I wish I hadn't gone, gone to Bangor. I'd like to, like to have come to that last night. I'd rather go to that, actually, what I did in Bangor. So anyway, now the other thing I want to hand out, uh, Austin, do you mind giving me a hand, grab that big pile right there? And Cassidy, could you help Austin? Jocelyn, could you guys hand those out? Make sure every adult or teen gets it. If you're on the teen Bible class at Katie Christian, you get this every week anyway. This is going through the Bible over a six-year plan. This is a daily devotional. So every Monday you can read five to ten verses, whatever it is. And then you can answer two questions. What has God said to you by reading that passage of Scripture? And Justine, the second one is how can you apply it to your life, right? Took the words right out of your mouth. So 
really, I encourage you, get involved with reading the Bible every day. How many here can tell me who wrote the Bible? God wrote the Bible. You know what? He wrote it to you and to me. It's a letter to us on how to live down here. He wants to speak to us. He wants to communicate with us every day. And if you read the Bible, he will speak to you every day. And if you pray, you can talk to him every day. You can communicate and build that relationship. So please take those home, look at them. They're very simple. You don't even have to look, them up, look it up. The verses are right there for you. These are all out of the New Living Translation, so they're all in the same wavelength like that. I can use the New King James. I can use the King James that some people use. I can use a lot of different things. I like this to study the Word of God with like that. So I encourage you to read it. It's an easy read for you like that. There's no thes and thous for those of you that have trouble reading the thes and thous and don't talk like that anymore. So use it, read it, but get close to God when you're reading it that right there. So that's what we have for announcements. At this time, I am extremely excited to have a brother I met on the phone, that I met by Skype, I met by a resume, but finally yesterday I got to meet him in person, face to face. And I want to introduce him. And this is Jim Lott. Jim, come forward. Pastor Jim Lott. Pastor James Lott. I've been calling him Jim. I hope that's the right thing to do. He'll tell you if it isn't. And his wife is Tina. It was just sitting right here. And his son is John. And I, I'll, I was going to have them speak. Maybe they're all praying for Jim right now. I don't know. Here comes Tina. Oh, Tina's getting a cup of coffee. All right. Or tea. I don't know what she's got there. All right. But this is his lovely wife, Tina. Give Tina a hand. And... We had fun going out to lunch with him yesterday. Heather and I spent the afternoon with him. John may be in the restroom. I don't know if John's getting a cup of coffee or not. I wanted to tell you what John is doing right now. John is a senior at the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. So I get choked up thinking about that stuff. And when we were doing that video, I was excited knowing that John would be here today. So he's a fine young man. I'm excited he graduates in May. I'm sure his mom and dad are pretty proud of him. So, welcome, Pastor Jim. We're glad to see you. God bless. God bless. Give him a good hand. Well, it's an honor to be here. And uh, it really is be an honor to come and uh, uh, talk to somebody about the Lord and talk about the Word of God. But before we get started, um, let me a little background. I was born in Brazil, South America. My dad was a missionary. There were missionaries in Brazil. My mom and parents, my dad actually passed away on the mission field. But they were on the mission field for 53 years. I grew up in, uh, in South America. I never lived in the United States until I joined the Army in 1976. Uh, we're in Brazil, and the um, story of my dad going to Brazil is a whole different thing. But when we were growing up, my parents were trying to learn the language and trying to understand uh, Portuguese. So, of course, my oldest sister was born, I was already born in the States, then my older brother was born, then my sister, and then I came along. And while they were learning Portuguese, while well, they spoke Portuguese, we read Portuguese, and we didn't speak English in the house. I remember my parents complaining, and what happened was my grandparents from Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, came down to visit us. And my granddad was very upset that he couldn't talk to his grandkids because his grandkids didn't speak English. So my parents decided, well, at home we'll speak English, and then outside we'll speak Portuguese in different languages. So I grew up, I graduated out of a high school in Puerto Rico in, in Spanish, and I joined the Army. And when I joined the Army, I did it as a runaway. I, um, I was running from a calling that God has put on my life for many years. When I was 15 and 16, we were preaching already. My brother and I was already preaching. We were already doing services. We were leading youth group. And I turned 18. I told my mom, I says, I'm going to go join the Army. And, of course, my dad said, that's great. He believed that every, every person, every male should be at least one tour in the Army. And so... I left, and my mom sat there and gave me a Bible, and she says, well, I want to make sure you read the Bible, and I want to make sure you get in church. And I said, Mom, it'll be lucky if I even walk through a door of a church because our, my life was Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, 
mon uh, Monday evenings, we had Bible study. Wednesday night, we had church. Thursday night, we had youth group. Friday night, we had prayer meeting. And Saturdays, we had to do evangelical outreaches and go to house to house. And then we started the week again. And that's what I grew up in. And I ran away. And my mom gave me a Bible. And it was so a point that I was kind of embarrassed. But, you know, I did come back. I was at a church. And when, uh, when that realization came that it is not as simple as being a Christian to fulfill the commission that God has given you. And I was going to church on Sunday mornings. I mean, I was out drinking. I was out partying. I was out doing all these crazy things. I was even, it was just because I grew up, where am I supposed to be on Sunday morning? At church. So I would even go to church with hangovers. But I was at church. And I really, and this is what changed my life, because I really believe I don't care why, how, or where that you go. When you listen to the word of God, it does not come back void, and it does make changes. And that gave my life back to the Lord. My life changed, and I pursued a outreach and doing what I can do for the Lord to a point where we started working in the church. We started doing stuff, working with the youth, working with all this stuff, go, doing the work of God. And then, pe then pastors started saying, Jim, I think God has a call on your life to be a pastor. I said, buddy, you taught me that one more time. I'll go find me another church. And what, years passed, and I remember my mom came down to visit us, and I, was pre I preached at a church called The Open Door. And my mom was in a wheelchair, and she was sitting there. And I remember looking at her in tears. You know, and she told me after this church, she says, I thought you were never going to step foot in a church, much less get behind a pulpit. But anyway, so I met my wife. She was in college in uh, North Carolina. For, she's from South uh, Korea, and I'm from Brazil. And, you know, we make fun. I made fun of the church down in uh, Favor one time. I, they kept saying that, you know, they're Southerners. And, uh, and they're talking about the Civil War and about Yankees and them being Southern. I'm, you know, we're true, we're true Southerners, man. We're, we're the core of America. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're a bunch of Yankees. And they looked at me and said, huh, in the world did you say that for? I said, where were you born? Well, I was born in the South. I said, no, you weren't. You were born in the North. And they go, what are you talking about? I said, I was born in the South. I was born south of the equator. I was born in Brazil, okay? And in Brazil... Down there, we call all you guys Yankees. And they looked at me and they says, okay. Then I said, then I get this perspective. And this is where the Christian perspective comes in. In Brazil, I'm a Yankee because I was born in northern Brazil. I wasn't born in the southern part of Brazil. I was born in northern Brazil. I was born on the Amazon River in the little town of Belém, which is Bethlehem. And so, therefore, in the Brazilians, I'm called a Norteño, a northerner. So it's all perspective, and that's how we're talking about Christians, and that's what I really want to talk about today. But before we do that, we had that video up here, and I told uh, Johnny about it. You know, I did 20 years in the military. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of it. Uh, I've, been in, uh, I've been in churches where I have seen churches actually turn me down from speaking there because of my military background, period. And it's, it's refreshing to know that, you know, soldiers are not just mindless killers. They are human beings. They're defending the flag. They're defending our freedoms to have churches like this. But I'm going to tell you, most people get upset, and the church got upset with me about it. And I told them, I said, I was talking about Afghanistan. This was just after we had invaded. We had gone into Afghanistan, and the, the war was basically over. This was just after when George Bush was on the, on the aircraft carrier and had declared victory. And we were talking to him, and the guy sat there, he goes, well, look at you guys. Look at what this country, so you're saying that this country needs to be a country under God, a country that is a Christian nation, but yet we're sending people to Afghanistan, and they're killing people. And I says, do you realize that the troops in Afghanistan, when we got there, it, to, at that period was the first time that the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached on the streets of uh, Kabul in eight hundred years 
And it was the American soldiers that took the Word of God, that took the Bible, and gave them the freedom that they were able to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And today, there are ministries, there are churches that have been established in Afghanistan and in Pakistan by American soldiers that went over there, and guess what? Was missionaries paid by the United States taxpayer money and took the Bibles and represented themselves into the what we have called as church. And this morning, I was praying in my devotions, and I was trying to get my, my, um, my sermon down, trying to figure out where and what sermon I was going to preach, and I had it already written out, and, and I already got it all figured out, and I started reading over it and was not comfortable. And then I shook it off, and I said, come on, Loft, get, get, get your act together here, man. Started reading it again. Still was not comfortable. And then I started praying. I said, Lord, I've got less than an hour. I mean, if you don't want me to preach this, you should have told me this yesterday. And so I changed it. And the reason I changed it was because, you know what? I thought about it. I've been praying about it. I'm going to talk to you about philosophy of ministry. And I want to talk to you about what it is to be a Christian and what your philosophy, I believe, should evolve yourself around. So before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you and you alone. You are a mighty God. You are the God, Lord, that loved us before we even knew you, oh, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask that you would open up the heart of this place, Lord, open up the heart of this fellowship, Lord, that we would receive from you, Lord, that our hearts would be open, Lord, that your mighty hand, Lord, would touch this area, Hancock County, Lord, that every single person, Lord, would have the ability to hear and understand the simplicity of what you did on that cross. Lord, we know it was wasn't easy for you to send your son. And Lord, as even I was talking to other people today about it, you know, it's so easy for me to go do something. But right now, my son is getting ready to deploy, Lord, into Afghanistan this summer. And now it's, it's so much harder to send the son to do the work than it is to do it yourself. But yet you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on that cross. So, Lord, I ask that that sacrifice would be known and that the Holy Spirit would touch everyone in this county and that they would understand the only thing they need to do is open their hearts to you. So, Lord, as I preach today, I ask that you would touch every word that I speak, Lord, that it would land on good soil. And, Lord, if it's any word that I speak that is not from you, then let it fall on deaf ears. But if it's from you, Lord, let it become alive in their hearts. I thank you. I praise you. I give you the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I want to talk about fishing. I believe there's three essential elements of fishing. I talked to Johnny on the phone about this, and this is what kept coming back to me. I think there's three essential elements of of fishing. Now, how many of you here like to go fishing? How many here really like to go fishing? And what does that mean? Well... Some people like to go fishing when it's nice weather, right? How, some of you like to go fishing when it's right. How many would you like to go out right now and go out here and sit on the lake and go fishing right now? Very many of you, okay? Now, so what does that mean? Well, I believe to go fishing, first of all, you've got to have a what? A desire, right? You've got to like it. Now, would you not like to go fishing? And I tell you right now, how many of you here don't like to go fishing? All right, fine. All of you that don't like to go fishing, what we're going to do here in five minutes is we're going to go out here, we're going to get in an open truck with no covers, and then we're going to drive down to the ocean, and we're going to go fishing. How many volunteers would there be? Okay. Okay. But those volunteers like to go fishing, right? But how many of you that would not like to go fishing would volunteer? Not very many, right? So even, you know, who it was. Remember in Matthew 4, 18, 21, when Jesus was walking. I'm going to paraphrase. You can look it up. Matthew 4, 18 through 21 was when Jesus was walking on the seashore. And he walks up and he sees these fishermen. And he goes what? He says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
Andrew, the first man that came and responded, immediately ran and told his brother, I found the Messiah. You see, he had a desire for the Messiah. He was not looking for his credentials. He did not go, well, Jesus, show me your credentials before I'll follow you. Nowhere here in the scriptures did Jesus come and make the great miracles before he called his fishermen. He says, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, the two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, netting in the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. You see, they had a desire. Now, if I talk about fishing right now, if I say, okay, guys, we're going to go fishing. Now, I don't know the fishing in this area, but I know Nag Head, North Carolina, we can go down there and we can go fishing. And what we're going to do is, it's a 14-hour drive, but we're going to go down there and we're going to go deep sea fishing for a three-hour fishing trip. And we're going to drive 14 hours, go down there, go fishing, three hours, turn around, four and 14 hours back. And we're going to leave tomorrow morning at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, how many would volunteer, how many would be standing out here in the parking lot waiting to go? Okay, three or four of you. Now, why not everybody? Because not everybody's interested in it, right? Well, do you know we find that same problem sometimes with evangelism, to become fishers of men. We sometimes are saved. We are sometimes, we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know what? We do not have that desire to be fishermen. That was me back when I was 18 years old when that pastor started preaching in that church and started going, how many of you have a desire to be a fisherman? How many of you have a desire to go out and reach the lost? How many of you in here have a burning desire to see that every single human being on this planet would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I sat there. Not really. And I even made excuses. I mean, I grew up in church now. I grew up reading this word. I grew up studying the word of God. I mean, before I was 15, I know I had read it at least five, six times. Because my dad made me do it. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, that's fine, pastor. Pastor. But the Bible says the only thing I have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to heaven. I done my dom. I'm done. I don't need to do anything else. And he kept on asking these questions. And he goes, how many have a desire to really read the word of God? Not really. And then he asked a simple question. He says, you know. How can you love the Lord Jesus Christ and not have the desire that Jesus had? You see, Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to come, leave glory, come to the planet, even come in the planet 2,000 years ago. I mean, he could have come today. Why did he come 2,000 years ago? He could have come today And instead of walking from Nazareth to Bethlehem, he could have been riding in a Cadillac. Air conditioning. Have a nice four-lane highway. Have shoes. And to be a little hard, have running water. But no, he came 2,000. Why? Because, see, it was the time that the father had called that his son would sacrifice his life. He was willing to come because he loved his father. His father loved his people. His father loved every single human being on the planet. And he had a desire to do the will of the father. And so he came. He walked to the cross. Do you realize who Jesus was? He was fully God and fully man. But yet he allowed men to spit on him so that he could fulfill the calling that the Father had. How can we be Christians? And that's what this pastor was talking about. How can you be a Christian and not have that desire? 
And I thought about it, and I went, man. Then he told a very simple thing. He says, you know, I might suggest you go to that cross. And I did, and I started to pray, and I started asking the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, you got to help me here. You know, I had to get that desire. But you know, what was interesting was I did not feel condemned. I did not feel wrong by not having the desire. And it wasn't that God was going to punish me for not having his desire. Because Jesus, God said what? You don't have to have my desires. You just got to believe in me. But how can I love my Lord Jesus Christ? How can I give myself to him fully and not try to embrace what he wants? How many of us here are married? Okay. How many how, men? You love your wife. How many men in here love their wives? Do you give any of the desires that she has in her heart? Of course not, right? You married her. She listens to you. She stays quiet. Don't speak up. And you do what I tell you to do. And don't do nothing. I'm not going to give you nothing. You earn it. And is that how we do our wives? How many of you ever bought a present for your wife? Okay. How many wives ever bought a present for their husband? How many parents ever given a, a present to their child? How many children ever given a, pre a present to their parents? Now, why would you do all that? You do it because you were afraid to get beat up on? Well, husbands may be. <laughs> but why, honestly, did you do that? Because you loved her, right? Now, why do you buy things for your wife? Is it because you like it, or is it because you love her? One guy told me, he says, no, I buy her stuff because that's what I like. I said, really? So you like dresses? <laughs> and he says, well, no. I said, you never bought your wife a dress? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, why? It's because that's what she liked. Because we love her. So how can we love Jesus Christ and not have that desire that Jesus had? But is it wrong not to have it? No. You know, it's very simple. If you look in Luke, you read the scriptures. How many of you here believe that God answers prayers? Now, how many of you have ever prayed and asked the Lord for a job? How many have ever been answered? Now, how by how getting the job, how is that going to give you a desire to love God or desire to serve him? But yet he still answered it, right? How much greater will the Lord answer a prayer that is asking the Lord for something that's in his heart? When you say, Lord, I don't have that desire. I love you. I believe in you. I know you died on the cross for me. I know I cannot get to heaven without you. I know it was the blood that cleanses my sins. I know there's nothing that I can do to get to heaven except believe on your son. I know this. But, Lord, I don't have the desire. I don't want to go to Bible study. I don't. So help me, Lord. Ask him for the desire. Not in the condemnation way. Not feeling that you're less of a Christian. Because you know what? It doesn't make you a greater Christian to have that desire. It just makes you a Christian that has the desire. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, right? So can I increase my faith on my own? Can I make my faith greater to God on my own? No, you can't. Because God says he gives you the faith. And it's through the desires and the love for him, seeking him, that will give you greater faith. 
You know, I can come to church every Sunday. I can live here in church and go to hell. You're not saved by coming to church. You're saved by believing on the cross and what Jesus did on that cross and when he rose again on that third day. So you need to have, so in the having a desire to fish, first you need to have that desire to be a fisherman. Does that mean have anything to do with salvation? No. The work of the cross is sufficient for salvation. We're talking beyond the cross now, guys. Too many of us are living at the cross. Is Jesus still on the cross? No. He's at the resurrection. He's alive. So we got to get beyond the cross now. We need to get that desire. The second thing is, to be a good fisherman, you need to have what? To be a good fisherman. If we go out fishing right now, what do we need? Equipment? Patience? What else do we need to be a good fisherman? The right spot? Would bait help? Now, let's go back to that story. We decided we're going to go to Nag Head, North Carolina, out there on the Outer Banks, and we're going to go deep sea fishing. And we all decided we're going to go. So we all have this desire to go fishing. And we all get in the cars, and we got this big old, big old bus. And we're getting ready to go down there, and we start driving. We're headed south, and we're talking. You know how fishermen talk, man. Man, we're going to need a trailer to bring you all the fish that we're going to catch. We're going to need all of this stuff, man. We're going to, I'm going to catch, so I'm going to catch, a, I'm going to catch 30 blue marlins. We're all talking big. We're ready to go fishing. And we show up 12 hours, 14 hours later. We show up at Nag Hills, North Carolina, and I get out of the car and I have the bus, and I go, okay, guys, let's go fishing. I got to pick on Johnny here, okay? So, so Johnny comes up to me and goes, well, Jim, I thought you said we're going to go deep sea fishing. I said, yeah. And he says, uh, to go deep sea fishing, you need a boat. And I went, well, that's fine, but I got the desire. He says, but it ain't going to work that way, man. You had the desire to be here, but you need a boat. I said, why? Jim, you're going deep sea fishing. You're going out in the ocean. You need a boat. Okay, man. So I spend two hours looking to finally hire a boat. We all get on boat. Now, you know, when you leave Nag Head, North Carolina, you got to work your way through the Outer Banks. So we get on the boat, we're getting ready to go, and here's Johnny again. Hey, Jim, you know how to navigate this thing? Come on, Johnny. I have the desire, and I've got the boat. I have the desire, and I've got the Word of God in my hand. But Johnny goes, bud, but you need to know how to use it. Man, I don't know how to use this thing. So I spend another two or three hours. I finally hire a pilot, a captain of the boat. And we get the pilot on there, and and I said, hey, man, you know where to go? He goes, yeah, man, I know how to work this thing, no problem. So we hire him. And we pay him his money, and we get on the boat, and we get out. We get back by the islands, and we're out there in the middle of the ocean. And the captain goes, All right, guys, you need to pull out your rod and wheels, and you need to put your bait out. And we're looking at him, well, we don't have any. And Johnny again comes to me and goes, Jim, come on, man. Johnny, come on, man. I got the desire. I've got the boat. I hired a captain. What more do you want? He says, man, we've got to have the equipment now. We've got to have the bait. So, man, come on. So we go back into the boat back. We finally get it. I finally get the rods and wheels. We get the bait. We get everything back on the boat, and we're back out in the ocean. How great of an experience that that fishing trip would have been. Now, we might catch something, right? But the day's gone. The time is gone. The frustration is there, and we're there. So I have the desire but you see, you need more than that with the gospel to be fishermen. 
And, you know, a lot of churches do just that. They says, I have a desire, and I brought this up, and I'm not trying to slam anybody here, but listen, you have the building, you have the boat. You're looking for a senior pastor. But, you know, that's not the end of it. Just like on that fishing trip, we hired a boat, we hired, we bought the property. Now we hired a senior pastor, so now we can just sit back and do nothing, and it's good. But you see, to be a fisherman, you not only have to have the desire, you not only have to come to church, but you also have to do what? Go fishing. You still have to physically get that pole, throw it in the water, bait it, and what else you got to do? Reel him in. You've got to do the complete process. So, my philosophy is very simple. To be a fisherman, to be a Christian, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about how do we fulfill the heart of Jesus Christ. We get the desire. We don't have it, we ask for it. It's not hard. And I know the Lord will give it to you. Because he's given me things that I didn't need. I just asked for and he's given it to me. How much more would he give me something that's in his heart? Now I need to get equipped. I need to go to Bible studies. I need to go and learn the word of God. I need to go and learn how to use this word. <coughs> this word means nothing. This book has no power whatsoever if it sits on a closet. And gathering dust. The word of God gets his power when you do what? When you uh, open that book. And you look down there and you start what? Oh, man. What did John tell me today? When Jesus has spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Cedron, where was a garden and which he what? He entered and his disciples. You see, Jesus goes with you. <clears throat> but it doesn't work if you don't open the word. So now you've got the desire. You've got the building. You might have hired a pastor. Now it's time for you to get into the word of God. Start reading it. Start learning the word. Start learning how to use it. You're not going to be able to be a good fisherman if you don't know how to use the equipment that the Lord has given you. Now, does that mean I have to be a, an expert of the Bible? Absolutely not. You know, a few verses you can learn. Anybody know what John 3, 23 says? You know it. You just don't know the verses. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many of you ever heard that verse? Thank you. You got it. It is not John. See, you got that from the, from the conversation we had this morning. Thank you. Romans. Now, what, what, there's a practical story there. What is that about? How are you going to know? That whoever you hire or whoever comes up here and preaches to you is preaching you the truth if you don't know the word of God. I can come up here and tell you anything I want to if you don't in the word of God. How are you going to know that you're being taught correctly if you're not in the word of God? You see, so it's not just an offensive weapon. It's also a defensive weapon. How are you going to know that you're going to go deep sea fishing... How many of you ever here have gone deep sea fishing? It's great. How many of you ever caught a blue marlin? I didn't either. Friends of mine did. But I saw them, I mean, the excitement. I mean, when they were trying to wheel it in, man, they're fighting it, man, back and forth. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there going, man, you know, you don't know the experience. And those of you that have seen someone, someone that has done and taken the gospel and saw someone change their lives and give their lives to the Lord, and you're able to bring that person into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
Do you know your faith just jumps? And one guy told me, he said, I don't like fishing, okay? I'm not a fisherman. And one guy told me, he said, you know why you don't like the fish? I said, why? He said, because you've never caught one. And he says, you're right. I know because the first time I had, I, we, we, I tell you, the first time I saw a person, I was in training, and I was in evangelism explosion, and we had all this training done. We had these, these super questions that we're ready to answer, and we already had the answers ready. And the simple question was, if you died right now, and you got to heaven, and God asked you a simple question, why should I let you into heaven? Anybody got an answer? Because Jesus is the answer. But you know how many qu- answers I've gotten? I'm a deacon in a church. I says, well, then deacon in the church, you're going to hell. Because you can't get into heaven by being a deacon. Well, I'm a pastor. I said, well, you're going to hell because you can't become, go to heaven by being a pastor. Well, I go to church every Sunday. Well, you're not going to heaven, going to church every Sunday. And I learned the answer. The answer is correct. Because, Lord, because Jesus died on the cross and he paid for my sins because I can't get it there by myself. So I'm getting in there and my ticket was bought on the cross of Jesus. That's how I get into heaven. I knew these answers. I was ready for all of those answers I just gave you. The guy looked at me and says, if God ever asked me that question, I'm going to go to hell because I don't know how to get to heaven. And you know what? I didn't know how to answer him. I was, it caught me off guard. But when I did see that change in his life, my faith just jumped. I, I, I took that one extra step of faith then. And guess what? What happened to my desire? It just went up again. But see, if you never throw, if you never go fishing, if you never throw that pole out there, you never throw that bait out there, You never throw the gospel of Jesus Christ out there. How many people are going to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Zero. How can you be a fisherman of men? First of all, I got to have a desire. Second, I need what? I need to have the equipment. I need to know how to do it. And that doesn't mean I need to know everything about the word. That means I need to know enough to defend myself. Now, this is one thing that we used to use, and I use this a lot. How many of you here could tell me about Jesus and how to get saved? How many here don't, could not do it? Honestly, be honest. Well, you know what? This is what I used to carry around. And I used to tell people, I open it up to the back where? Back pages of a little book. Johnny carries a little track. Well, sir, God loves you. It says right here in, oh, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Also in Romans, what are, I can't even read that. There you go, 5, 8. I don't have to be perfect. And then it says, you know, it says here, all are sinners. In Romans 3, 25, for all have sinned and come short of the glory. Oh, man, God's remedy for sin. Well, sir, only thing you have to do, all the wages, the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus gave your life to you. Who can be saved? All can be saved. You believe that? Well, yeah, well, here, make this little prayer with me. Lord, God, I confess that I am a sinner. Right there. It's all there for you. You see, what I'm trying to get at, I don't have to be an expert. I have to be what? I have to have enough equipment to be able to. If we go deep sea fishing right here, and you hire a good captain that can take you to the place that there's blue marlins, and there's captains in Puerto Rico when we were there that will guarantee you that you'll catch a fish. Because why? What's that? They know where the fish are, and they know how to get there, and they also know how to teach you how to use the equipment. But now, let's say I hire that captain. I go on that boat, 
but I refuse to listen to them, and I refuse to listen to the, the instructions on how to catch a fish. How will my fishing trip be? Very poor. You see, Jesus Christ is our chief fisherman, and he's given us instructions in his word. He has given people the heart. I mean, he's given Johnny, the, 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 this whole fellowship. He's given every one of you that are here the heart to come and listen to the word of God. Only thing you have to do is open your heart and start studying, start reading. And the lady asks, we need more prayer meetings. Absolutely. We need more Bible studies. Absolutely. We need to have groups at home that are coming together and studying the word of God. And I will guarantee you, once you start studying it, once you start learning it, once you start building that foundation on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the truth of the word, you will want to learn more and more and more. And eventually, you will want to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. And the sad thing is, You may one day walk into this building, walk to Johnny or whoever's in charge here and says, I'm leaving the fellowship because God has called me to be a minister of the word of God and I'm going to go and serve him. You may be called to serve him in Afghanistan. You may be called to serve him in Brazil. And as Johnny, I believe, has been called to serve him right here in Hancock County. But you see, the desire comes first. Not, I'm not talking salvation now. I'm talking a desire to become what Jesus said to his disciples. We, what, what are we supposed to do? Go out and make disciples. We're commanded to do that. How can we do that if we're not willing to do that? How can we become fishermen if we're not willing to do it? And, of course, the third part of being a fisherman is a place to fish. Let's go back to the story. We all decided we want to become fishermen. We all decided that we need a boat. We all decided all that, and we hired a captain. We did all of that. And we right here in the parking lot. And we sit there, and we go, okay. All right, guys, here's your rod and reels. We're in the parking lot. Here's your bait. Let's go ahead and throw your, throw your wheels out there and throw your hooks out there in the parking lot and start bringing in the fish. How many fish are we going to catch in this parking lot? Three. <laughs> okay. How many live, real fish will we catch in this parking lot? Why? Wrong spot. Now, where's my fishing? You see, how many of you have ever seen the deadly, uh, the, 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 there's a show called The Deadly Catch? How many of you ever watched that? How many of us here today are ready and equipped and trained properly to go on one of those boats, on those catches, and, and, and do the work of that boat? None of us are. Why? Because we need training, right? Now, do we all have to face those type of fishing? No. Sometimes it's a nice little pond or a lake, very calm. I mean, I have times when I have led people to the Lord and showed them how to get there, and it was just like the guy I was telling you about earlier. It was just, hey, guy, if you die, man, if God asks you a question, how are you going to get into heaven? I don't know. My son well, son, I can tell you. I can explain to you. Only thing you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Believe that his sins, that your sins are nailed to that cross. And believe that he rose again on the third day. Put your heart and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. Very simple. But there's also been times when I try to tell someone about the Lord, I get cussed out. I get yelled at, called a hypocrite, called a a right ring freak. You see, 
That's a different battle. You know, people got mad at me. Pastors got mad at me. One guy asked me, if uh, we're talking about reading the Word of God. And I, says, uh, I said, yeah. And I asked the pastor, and I asked him, I says, have you ever read the Koran, the Muslim book? And he says, no. I says, well, I have. He says, what? That's a pagan book, man. What is wrong with you? I says, um, I learned in the military to defeat the enemy, you got to know the enemy. And, you know, I have led Muslims to the Lord using the Koran. Because you know the story of Moses is in the Koran, where God called Moses to the mountain on the burning bush and says, go free my people, the Jews. Do you know Jesus is in the book? Do you know that there's a, there's a part in the, chapter, in the book in the Koran that talks when a, uh, Muhammad is talking to Abraham and talking about the Messiah coming and his name would be Jesus is in the Koran? And when I showed that to a Muslim, he goes, I don't understand what's going on. I says, what's going on is you are being led by a false prophet. You're being led by a false God. You're following an, an Allah, a God that's telling you to die for him. I'm telling you, you need to worship a Jehovah that is not telling you to die for him. He sent his son to die for you. There's a difference. But you see, it took more training to do that battle. And not everyone is called to do that battle. Just like not everyone is called to be, every, not like everyone that likes to go fishing is called to go to the North Seas and do those battles with those spiritual waves. But some of you may be called to do that. You know, how many of you here have a boss? A real boss. How many of you here have a boss that you would call a very bad boss? Have you ever had one of those bosses that are just a jerk? Just that you just, oh, man. You know, I had one in the Army, and I remember praying and saying, Lord, Man, Lord, if you love me, you would take this guy away from me. You know? So, Lord, just promote him or, or, or bust him or, or fire him or, or get him transferred. I mean, he's really making my life miserable. And I went to a pastor and I told him, I said, Pastor, we need to pray that this guy would get demoted. And he goes, why? I said, man, the guy makes my life Hell. And he looked at me and says, are you praying for him? I said, yeah, he got fired. He says, is that what the word of God says? No. We did pray for him. He did come to the knowledge of Jesus. I didn't lead him, but I did pray that God would turn his life. And that guy, his name is Alan West. He's a pastor today in a church in Oklahoma. And the only thing I feel bad about was God had put me in his path to be the one to take the gospel to him, and I failed. Somebody else did it because I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. And worst of all, I wasn't willing So I don't know where your rivers are. I don't know what pond you're fishing in. I don't know what storm you're battling. But I will tell you this, and I will tell most people this, if you have no opposition to your faith, then you are not doing anything to scare the devil. A friend of mine came to me and said, man, he had a business. Business is going bad. I mean, the guy started uh, spending the money, doing things that he needed to do for the ministry. And I looked at him. I said, man, that's great. He looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? I said, that means you're stirring up the devil. And the devil knows who you are, and he's scared of you. But you see, you can get defeated by the devil if you're not what? prepared 
and found it in his word. You know, I, I taught a sermon, which is a whole nother sermon here, but on conviction and condemnation. If you ever feel condemned about something that you're doing, tell the devil to go to hell. You cannot be condemned if you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit can convict you. Holy Spirit can tell you you're doing something wrong, but you're not condemned. Because there is not a power that the devil has that can conquer the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. You've got victory in him. So when the devil comes and starts bugging you, How many of you heard the, the song, The Power in the Blood? There's power. You know, there's a whole sermon on power of the blood. But I want to cover one little area of it. And the closing statement, I prayed on it one day, and I told everybody, I said, how many of you here are being attacked by the devil? And the devil's bringing up things in your past. How many of you have ever been accused and stuff been brought up, stuff that you've done in the past? Okay. How many husbands get, uh, get that all the time? You know, wives have a memory that goes back 400 years, okay? But how many, honestly, how many of you have gotten where you felt this, you know, you're not good enough because you've sinned or you've lied or you did this or you've done that? You know, this is a, I'll give you a tell you. When you start getting these thoughts in your minds, and you've already asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You've already covered that in the blood. My brother told me one day, he says, Jim, how are you going to be a pastor in Nicaragua and go and preach the gospel and people that you're shooting at? And I said, it's very simple. If I've offended anybody, if I did anything wrong, that's already nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ, and I've been forgiven. But you know, if those thoughts keep coming to you, my suggestion is you tell them to be quiet. Just everybody just be quiet. All right, even right now, how many of you are thinking about lunch? Right now. There you go. How many of you think about, man, when is this guy going to quit talking, man? <laughs> well, I tell you what, tell your mind, everything, just, just, just try to blank your mind out. For, don't, even th don't even try to listen to my voice. Just try to just be completely quiet. And tell those thoughts, just be quiet. Then you tell those thoughts, can you hear it? And I know he's thinking, he's thinking, hear what? Hear that drip? 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 What's in your mind right now? What is that drip? That's the blood of Jesus cleaning my sins. So devil, get out of my mind. I am saved. I am washed by the blood. And there's not a thought that you can put in my mind that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse. Clean your mind. Surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will make you a fisher's amen. He will give you the desire. And if you have the desire, you will study the word. Take advantages. Do your devotions in the morning. Do your prayers. Get into the word of God. And you know what? If you don't have it, I have many times. I remember reading Romans one day on a chapter, and I didn't understand a word I read. You know, I just read it. It was almost like I checked the block. Okay, Lord, I did my reading. I said, man, I have no idea what I read. And I read it again. Still didn't understand a word I said. What happened? I turned around and said, well, Lord, give me the understanding that I need. And I don't want to do a check the block. I want to get into your word. And I want your word to become alive. I open up the word of God. I don't want it just to be a literary reading. I want it to come alive. In the, in the Greek it says alagos. The word becomes alive. It becomes on fire. How many of you ever heard a sermon and you've been reading the word of God? And you pull out your Bible and go, man, this is great. And you underline it. And months later, you go back and you read it and you say, why did I underline that? Because, see, at that moment, the Holy Spirit breathed upon it, and it came alive for you. That's why it became so important to you. 
when that happens, you say, Lord, give me the word. Now, what does it mean in my life? How do I apply this? And how does this apply to my family, to my job, to my country, to my city, to my county? Don't just sit there and become numb. But you know what? The Peter says, first Peter says, we were to be what? Living bricks. We're not to be sitting here just dead bricks on a building. We're supposed to be a living building. And then and talk to Johnny about, about reaching 30,000 houses in 30 days. Come on. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good you are or how great you think you are in the Word of God. If you have the desires, if you read the Word, and you're willing to go out there and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross and he looked down to the soldier? How many of you heard or read where he says, I thirst? But Jesus said, I'm not going to drink of the vine until I meet with the Father. He was not talking about physical thirst. He was thirsty that his people would come and follow him. He was thirsty because his hands were nailed to the cross. He could not pick up the word. You have to pick up the word. His feet were nailed to the cross. <clears throat> he cannot walk to those 30,000 homes. He needs us at the feet of the cross. And imagine Jesus looking at us and saying, I thirst. Will you be my hands? Will you be my feet? Will you speak? About my sacrifice. Will you be my disciples? So I leave you a challenge. And I even told Johnny yesterday. It's not about. An in building an empire. It's not about building a church. That has 5,000 members. It's about serving the Lord. And being kingdom builders. That when the Lord comes back, when he comes, he'll find this fellowship, your fellowship, your relationship with the Lord acceptable unto him. How can I get there? First, I need to know Jesus. First, I don't have to be clean. I don't have to be a perfect person. Jesus says, come as you are. You don't have to wear a suit. Man, you can even have a beard and come to the Lord. That's an internal joke with my wife. My wife doesn't keep, I grew a beard out. She just makes me shave it, you know. My dad had the same argument with his mom, with his wife. My mom, I remember using my dad's argument. Well, Jesus had a beard. It didn't work with her, and it don't work with my wife either. But what I'm getting at, guys, first you've got to accept Jesus Christ and give your life to him. And, you know, it's not a magical word you say. It's not just this magical thing. You know what? It's not my prayers over you. It's a relationship that you build with Jesus Christ in your heart. It's between you and God alone. If in the position that you're in, I told a prostitute, and she says, well, I need to get out of this lifestyle first. I said, no, you don't. You can get to accept Jesus Christ right now. The cleanup comes later, man. Your sanctification comes later, man. You know? Has anybody, has anybody in here has not accepted, and, I mean, truly given their life to the Lord, has not truly surrendered their life to Jesus Christ? Do you understand what that means? 
That means that you have put yourself on the auction block, and Jesus Christ has bought you with his blood. And now you no longer belong to yourself, but you belong to the kingdom of God. You are now a brother of Jesus Christ, and the Father is our God, the creator of the universe. You are now royalty. You now can go into the presence of the Lord. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You can go into the presence of God right now if you have accepted Jesus Christ. But see, that's a commitment between you and God. You need to make that commitment. My children grew up in church. And I've been talking to Johnny. Johnny's still talking about it. He says, well, families need to get their children ground in the Word of God. And I said, well, son, I remember us reading the Bible cover to cover on Sunday, on, on every morning before you went to school, and you guys were rolling your eyes and stuff. He said, but, Dad, that was boring. But you know what? We still did it. And what I used to do was I'd open up the Word and I'd start reading. And we would decide we would cover one or two or three chapters, whatever it was. And I would start reading. And I would kind of look at my boys. And then all of a sudden I would say, Jimmy. That means he would have to pick up right where I was reading. And then I would just start reading again. And then all of a sudden I would just go, Johnny. That way they would have to what? Follow and pay attention. You know what? One friend of mine told me, he says, well, you're forcing that on your children. I said, well, I'm the father. And they're in my roof, and they will do as I say. And guess what? I've got a father in heaven. He is my father. I'm in his roof. I'm in his house, and I will do what he says. And his word comes to me in the word of God. So if you have never made a commitment to the Lord, you know, that can be easily solved. And you can have eternity with the Father. If you've ever fallen away, if you're not doing what you should be doing, and you're really just checking the block, you know the cross of Jesus is always there for you. You know when Peter walked on the water, have you ever read that story? Have you ever read it real, clear, real carefully? He says, Jesus, can I come out to you? Jesus didn't command him to come out to that water. He asked, and Jesus says, sure, come. And Peter's walking on water. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and starts sinking. And this is my interpretation. I can just see Jesus with tears in his eyes, a smile on his face, reaching down and said, Peter, why would you take your eyes away from me and pulled him up? There was no condemnation. There was no screaming at him, no saying, Peter, you blockhead. What's wrong with you? You're walking on water, man. You're supposed to keep an eye on me. You dumb? If you read Peter, sometimes you may think so. <laughs> but you know what? I don't see that in that story. I see Jesus picking him up. Now I ask you a question. How many times did Peter walk on water? Twice. He walked going to Christ. Then he walked back to the boat holding on to Jesus. If you've fallen short, there's no condemnation. There's only Jesus. I can see a tear in his eye saying, daughter, son, here I am. Just come back. The Lord is going to move on you if you surrender to him. There's not a program. There's not a program that's going to save you. But there is an act that will save this county. And that's if you have a desire to be a fisherman of men.
Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you, Lord. I ask that you would touch the hearts of every person here, Lord. Lord, as Jesus said on the Sea of Galilee, Lord, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Lord, I ask right now that the Holy Spirit will speak to the hearts of every person that's listening to this voice. Lord, every person that's in this building, every person that's listening online or in their home. Lord, every person that listens to the recordings of this. Lord, that their hearts will be opened up, and they'll be like, 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 like the early disciples. Yes, yes. Yes, I'll follow you. And they'd be eager to do the calling that the Lord has for them. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, touch those that are listening to the voice right now. That they may be convicted, Lord, to know you better. And that the blood of Jesus would cleanse them. And that that conviction that the devil brings would turn to glory in the presence of an almighty God. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Wow. You know, I usually watch the clock, but I haven't looked at it once. So that was excellent. Excellent challenge today. We really appreciate that very much. Uh, at this time, we'll just dismiss in prayer, and we've got a potluck lunch today. Anybody know whether we've got a potluck lunch on tap? What's that? We can smell it? Well, I, I figured he caught somebody looking around. That's why he's wondering. You're watching the crock pots over there like that. Uh, I just want to make one announcement before we close in prayer like that. Next week, we're going to have a baptism. If there's anybody here, just like uh, Brother Jim was talking about today, we need to obey and follow God, what he wants us to do. If you've known Jesus as your Savior and have not been baptized, you really need to step forward and do that. It's just a step of obedience. And, and what it will do is it will make you excited, just like leading people to the Lord. When you obey him and you see the results, you feel like you're obeying the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you are. And it makes a difference in your life just knowing that you've done that. So I encourage you, Jeff, just speak to me at the, at the luncheon today. Speak to Jen, and we'll have it all prepared. We're already going to have a baptism next week. We want to give you a baptism invitation card so you can invite your unsaved friends and relatives to come. And when you're bapti being baptized, an excellent picture of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. We will see people saved if you do that and you invite your unsaved friends. So I encourage you. Next Sunday, there will be a baptism during the service like that. Okay? So don't forget that. Um, I didn't happen to talk to Jim. I'll talk to him later. I am a Gideon also when I was in business. I know you were a Gideon as well like that. So I know when you pulled that Bible out, I meant to mention it to you the other day like that. Uh, so we'll talk about that sometime as well. But please, you know, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed. And make sure you stay. If you didn't come prepared, I think there's plenty of food. Don't worry about it. I won't eat. I'll go to McDonald's afterwards. You stay and join us today and make sure to fellowship. Uh, get to know Jim, get to know Tina, get to know John. And I was a little confused. He kept calling him Johnny and me Johnny. So that you've got to realize he's their son, Johnny, and then he was picking on me, Johnny. He wasn't picking on them, him, he was picking on me. So there is two Johnnies here today, all right, just so you'll know. But uh, let's, clo let's close him. Yeah, well, there's other Johns, but there, I don't know whether John was a Johnny or not. I don't know what, he was a Johnny too? All right, there's a lot of Johnnies here today. I was picking on Johnnies, that's all I know. But, but let's close in prayer and let's have a nice time of fellowship together today. Dear God, I thank you so much for bringing uh, Jim and Tina and John to us today, God, and, and yesterday. It's just been a blessing for them to come up. A long travel for them. He could relate to that trip, I'm sure, to, to Nag's Head, God. He drove a long distance to come up to share that message with us, God, the message that you specifically laid on his heart to give us today. God, I pray that each one of us would truly listen to what you've said to us, would evaluate what you're saying to us, and then we'd apply it to our lives. Each one of us individually, God. Speak to us in a positive, mighty way. God, bless Jim, bless Tina, bless John, Jimmy, who's in college down there, preparing to be a worship pastor. Bless their family, God. Guide and direct in their life in a supernatural, powerful way. Give us a great time of fellowship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed. Please make them feel at home. Once we get